Hello again. Today we're going to have a look at basic autopilot operation in the TBM 930, one of the, I think, one of the best aircraft that's in the release version of Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. So let's get straight into it. We'll get into the aircraft. We're cold and dark. If we skip across, I've got a little nav map running in the background. Let's just clear out the map. Um, this nav map is really useful because we get a um, a trace of our flight path so we can easily describe things that we're doing. So we're going to take off from runway 5 at Southwest Oregon Regional Airport and we're going to do a great big circuit but we're going to use it really to demonstrate the use of the autopilot and playing with the nav radios to use the ILS. So and it's a nice clear day I've got the realistic weather as of right now in Oregon so what are we going to do? So let's get the airplane started up Control E to shortcut a few things so we get power on and the engine will wind itself up. So we'll give it a few seconds. If we look down here, you can see various things are being warned on the systems as they come up to speed. And as the the automatic startup does things, some of them will go out, some of them won't. So it's complaining about oil pressure, basically, yeah, because the engine hasn't started properly. So it's saying stall no heat and pit on no heat left right. So let's have a look over here. There's the switches for these here. Pit on left heater, pit on right and stall heater. So those are basically the heaters for the probes to stop them freezing up. Otherwise, you can have pretty disastrous effects on the flight control system. Parking brake is on. We want the parking brake on because we're sat on the tarmac. Auto cell, that relates to the fuel tank. So if we go and look up above us and look at the fuel section, there's fuel select and you've got manual which is by default or auto if you've got fuel selection on manual it's worth pointing out in this tbm if we look outside the fuel tanks are in the wings so most of the fuel is stored in the wings this is tr true of most aircraft actually um so if you leave and if you think about it, it's a low wing aircraft and the engine is above the level of the wings. So you have to pump the fuel up from the wing to the engine. Uh, if you leave it on manual, bearing in mind we've got a left and a right wing, there's a fuel tank selector here. So you can flick it between left and right to use the fuel in the left or the right wing tanks. It also has the option of switching it to auto, which I'm going to do. Now I've switched it to auto, auto, you will notice that the auto cell light has gone out, or indicator has gone out. So it's now saying bleed is off. If we go and have a look above our head again. Um, I'm just trying to remember where the bleed switch is. It's, a, it's the pressure, cabin pressure. So, oh, that might be down here. Let's get this out of the way. Do, 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 do. I can never remember where things are. Here we go, pressurization. So if you imagine this has got a pressurized cabin, this aircraft can fly at a high altitude. So the pressurization bleed is switched off. So in other words, we're going to keep pressurizing the cabin. So if we put that on automatic, it will automatically bleed off high pressure air from the cabin as it needs to so it won't you know, it won't turn the fuselage into a balloon basically um so if we have a look it's just saying we have the parking brake on now so the engine is running we can see that outside so the main drive of our story today is looking at the autopilot controls in the tbm 930 so before we get to the autopilot itself, it's going to be worth having a look at the barometer setting. So this controls, if you roll the mouse wheel on it, it rotates the knob and it changes the, the setting of the barometric pressure that the altimeter is using as its kind of zero level of ground level. So um, different places around the world 
have different barometric pressures at ground level and it varies from day to day. So you will find this in the, the weather report from an airport. It will tell you the rating to set the barometric pressure to. Once you're above a certain altitude, and again that varies around the world, but it tends to be, I think, 6,000 feet, you can press the barometer button and it'll put it into standard mode. And again on this it just pushed it back to 2993. For most of the world it's 2992. Um, okay, so let's go and have a look. So the only reason you're interested in the barometric pressure is the systems on the aircraft are going to think the floor is at the height or you know that um that you have set. So Oh, I'm not, I'm not explaining this very well, am I? If it was massively out, you could easily fly into the floor by setting an altitude that didn't actually correspond with the floor. Does that make sense? So if you're in thick fog and you thought you had 100 foot below you, but you actually only had 50 foot below you, you could smash into the ground quite easily. Um, okay, so the autopilot itself. The far left knob is the heading selector knob. And the button above it is heading hold mode. And again, you can switch these on and off when we're on the ground. So we, we know we're taking off on runway five, which is actually, if we have a look on the map, it's actually, the ILS is at 46 degrees. If we zoom in right onto the runway, we can see it's 44 degrees is the actual direction of the runway. So before we even take off, we can zoom out slightly and if you watch this heading number here and the little marker on the compass, we can turn this around by rolling the mouse wheel on it and we can change that direction. So I'm going to go all the way around to 44. So we can switch this on as well to put heading hold mode on or heading select. What that means is when we switch the autopilot on, it will automatically try and fly and stay flying at the heading that's been selected. Approach mode, it has an approach mode. So if you are tuned in to um, the ILS radio frequency, it can fly the approach for you. So it will stay not only following the radio beacon horizontally across the sky, it will follow it vertically down towards the ground. Um, BC, a back course. I'm not going to get into that today. It's for flying the opposite of the radio frequency radial that you have tuned in on a navigation radio. Um, approach mode we talked about, nav mode. So I'm only going to talk about this in terms of flying a flight plan um, and we're, we're not going to get too much into it today basically the the systems on the 930 in common with most modern aircraft you can actually program a flight plan in and when the autopilot is in nav mode if you have made a couple of other settings as well which we'll get into it will follow the plan that you have set instead of having to set vectors with the heading mode, you can just cl click the nav mode and it will find the flight plan where it's nearby and intersect it and go and follow the lines that you've, you've mapped out. FD, flight director, if we switch it on, you get that this marker appears on the head up display and that's kind of based on what you have told the aircraft to do. The pink line is what the aircraft thinks it should be doing and then if you turn the autopilot on the aircraft will follow what the pink one's doing but it's not, sometimes nice to have the flight director on so you might be orienting the airplane in a particular way but the flight director might not agree with you for for what you have actually set on any of the instruments to say you know to get to a particular height or to do a particular turn it might not want you to be turning as steeply as you are as you are turning for example and that leads us straight to the bank mode. You can half the amount of bank mode that it will use when it's making turns. Um, your damper. This relates to the behavior of aircraft when they are exiting or entering turns. You can very easily in a real aircraft 
induce an oscillation where as the ailerons let go of the air the an, an amount of momentum is imparted into the body and as the plane it, it can cause the plane to fishtail basically so if you keep hitting the ailerons it causes a thing called adverse yaw where the plane swishes from side to side as the aileron as the force of the ailerons kick it either way so your dampers is a or your damper is an automatic system built into the aeroplane to lessen the effect of that happening so again we can turn the your dampers on um xfr yeah it's just to transfer it between the pilot and the co-pilot so don't worry about that the light will fl flick over to the other side altitude select so we might choose we can see the number change here we might choose that we want to fly at a certain height once we've taken off so say if we went to 5,000 feet so we'll go up to 5 I'm just rolling the mouse wheel to do that and we could choose altitude hold mode and it's reset it so again some of these things there is a sequence to doing them turn altitude hold mode on the reason it's done that is when you are flying if you hit altitude hold it will it will halt at the the hold sorry at the altitude you are at so it makes sense when you switch it on you switch it on first and then you choose the altitude you want to fly to so i can now change away so this is the height we're at this is the height we want to be at next so we can say 5,000 feet, for example. And now we have several ways of getting there. The most obvious way is vertical speed mode. So we're going to say we want to get to 5,000, but we want to do it at a given rate. So we can say vertical speed mode, and you can roll the mouse. So you actually roll it down to go up, if that makes any sense. So I can roll down until I get to, say, 1,500. So the plane will climb to 5,000 feet at 1,500 foot a minute. I've got another option here of vertical navigation mode. If you have got a flight plan programmed in that's got altitudes for various waypoints, the autopilot can automatically follow it via the vertical navigation mode, or VNV, in this aircraft. It's called VNAV in the big airliners. FLC is an alternative to vertical speed. FLC is flight level change. So in, in other words, the aeroplane knows about its own limits and it will get to the height you have selected at the rate it thinks it can do it, rather than perhaps a comfortable rate. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's going to be much more aggressive in getting there. And again, you've got a button here, so once you're in the air and flying, you can switch between Mac units for the speed or indicated airspeed in knots. OK, so should we go and have a play? Oh, it's worth pointing out as well, we've got course here. This is only really applies to when you're pro tuning nav radios. You can see it's, it's turning this knob. We're not going to get into that today because we're not going to fly to a... Um, a VOR, VOR station we're only going to use ILS and a little bit of ready reckoning to show the heading being used so just run over that again quickly we have set the heading the heading bug to match you can see the number here and the, the pipper here we've set the heading to match the direction of the runway and we've set the altitude to 5000 remember we chose altitude hold then the speed then we went to ver sorry then the altitude altitude hold then the altitude we want then the vertical speed to get there and selected it and that allowed us to pre-select everything so the idea here is we get everything just how we want them so the moment we press the autopilot button we won't have anything to do it will the plane will just literally just carry on flying on its own without lurching around with us madly trying to tune things in okay Let's start rolling. So, wheel brakes off. It's control and full stop on the keypad, by the way, to turn the wheel brakes off, if you weren't aware. So we'll just go and taxi out to this exit from the apron. 
that's put our adjust our pl place in the seat slightly so we can see over the nose. I used the cursor key up arrow to do that. Okay, so now we're going to go back down the taxiway to find the end of the runway. And then we'll have a little bit of a play with the autopilot controls and finally the ILS itself. Actually, we may, it would be fun to hold short before we get on the runway and go and program a route in just so I can show you navigation via or just you know how you can program a route very easily in this aircraft. It's not too tough at all. But we're not actually going to use it for the flight. It's going far too fast down the taxiway. We would probably get told off for that. Let's slow down. Okay, went a little bit wide there, but oh well. So we'll just stop here for a moment, engage the wheel brakes again. It's warning us that the wheel brakes are on. Or oh, the parking brake, I should say. So let's have a quick look around this system on the TBM 930. There's several pages. There's the PFD page, which shows you some basic controls. The one you might use the most is this button at the top, which is why it's at the top. It lets you select the nav source that you're going to take note of in the various systems. So I'll leave it on FMS for the moment. The MFD page, the multifunction display, lets you do things like program a flight map, a uh, flight plan, which we're going to go and do. So if I go and click on flight plan, we'll put in, we'll live, We'll cheat here slightly. We, so we can see here we are at KOTH, Southwest Oregon. So we can add an origin to our flight plan. We're not going to follow this flight plan, by the way. KOTH. And you can see it's got a database built in, Southwest Oregon. I'll enter, and that's put in the source of our, or the, you know, the um, departure point of our flight plan. We can now add a destination. So if we go and have a look in this one nav map, let's go and choose a runway nearby. How about Roseburg um, Regional, which is KRBG. So Kilo Romeo Bravo Golf, Roseburg Regional. Enter. So we've now got our departure and destination, and we can add a waypoint if we wanted to. So if we zoom in slightly on this one nav map, there's a waypoint here called Sozki. So add an en route waypoint, S, O, Z or Z if you're American, K, Y, enter. So we can now see we've got um, from Southwest Oregon Regional en route to Soski, and then we can scroll down to see and, and we can insert waypoints along the way further you know put more waypoints into the flight plan if we want we, we can also by clicking on these various boxes change things so we could say at Solsky we want to be at 5,000 feet for example so it really is that simple to put a flight plan in while you're in flight in the um, the 930 one of the things I don't think is quite so clever or oh, it's worth pointing out as well once we've done that the flight plan is shown in the display so we can now see the range roll the roller should work for the range so we can zoom out and we can see that whole flight plan we can see SOS key and we can see KRBG so the thing I'm most interested in showing you next is how we're going to set up the ILS we're going to use the ILS to come into this runway here so if we go and cheat slightly and look at this nav map you probably have a printed plan if you are flying in the real world. We want 108.5. So 
we have to go onto the nav com page so we press the button next to it to go to the nav com page and again this is only going to show the com radios by default the same deal as any other aircraft where you get to put two different frequency frequencies in and flick between them but we want to put a nav radio frequency in so it's a little bit unintuitive you have to go and click on audio and radios and then on nav one you have to go and click on the frequency itself and it will ask you what you want to put in there so we wanted uh, 108.5 for ILS into runway 5 so I'm going to click on that frequency and say 10850 which has typed it into there I can press enter and again it's on the wrong frequency at the moment so I can click on it again and I can transfer them so again, I think that's a little bit clunky, but obviously it reflects the way the real airplane works. So we've now got ILS programmed in. So let's go and have a fly. So let's zoom back out. Take the parking brake back off, which will make that warning go away. Remember, we've re pre programmed everything on the autopilot ready to go. So as soon as we get to our sensible speed on the runway, We'll rotate and then we'll engage the autopilot almost straight away. I'm doing well at overrunning today, aren't I? So, flaps down to one or a third. I think it, I think it says 33% when you first move them down. If you wondered where the flaps are on the 930, it's this setting down here. OK, so let's centre the view back up, sit up in the seat slightly, full throttle, and away we go. So again, I'm balancing the torque of the engine with the rudder slightly. I'm just here slightly right, but as I get faster, it's getting easier. So rotate. And we're up, gear up, speed is increasing, flaps up. Trim the elevator slightly. Way turbulence. And then hit the autopilot button. Now, it's not going engaging, and I can tell you exactly why. If we scroll up and look over here, I forgot to switch on the power to the autopilot and the aileron trim. So there, I can switch on the autopilot, and it's correcting itself. Look, I've completely let go of the controls. So it is now doing... It's trying to get to 1500, it's doing 1450-ish feet a minute climbing towards 5,000 feet and it's maintaining 46 degrees 45 degrees see so it's it's doing its best against the elements I'm going to pull the throttle back a bit that's turbulence throwing us around that's not me touching anything and the, the autopilot is obviously going to fight against that to keep us nice and steady okay so let's have a play with the autopilot. Let's see what's happening first on little nav map. You can see we drifted ever so slightly until we let the autopilot kicker kick in and now it's holding a nice steady course. So we might want to turn left through 90 degrees. So we're traveling at for, uh, r there at 45 degrees or thereabouts. So we can keep this nice and simple for ourselves. We're going to turn left to 315 degrees. So what we can do straight away then, we're in heading hold mode, which means the autopilot is going to follow whatever heading we select. So we will turn this left using the mouse wheel to 315. If I can manage to hold on to it. Yeah, there you go. So it's going to turn all on its own. Remember, it's still doing the climb to 5,000 feet for us completely automatically. 
and it's being thrown all over the place. It's a very turbulent day. I've got realistic weather on. So even though there's not many clouds around, obviously these hills are kicking air around. We can actually be quite crafty about this. If we look in this on nav map, yeah, we can see there's an eight knot wind. And it's varying, it's kicking sideways quite a lot, so it's turbulent, which is what we're seeing. When we look out the window, we're being pushed around. Okay, so we can look on little nav map now, and you can see the autopilot is now flying us at 315 degrees. So let's follow the, generally this line of these nav beacons. So if we did another 90 degree turn, we'll be turning left to 225 degrees. So let's do the same again then. We'll turn left to 225 degrees. This is one of the things that's a real pain with Flight Simulator actually, is the animation of the cockpit means it's very difficult to hold on to the instruments. 215 degrees, there we go. So the plane is making its turn. We are now at 5,000 feet. So you will notice vertical speed mode has switched off because we've got to the target altitude. So it's gone back to altitude hold mode automatically. And we are flying back downwind. Actually, the wind has shifted around from when I sat down and planned this out. The wind was um, about 30 degrees different. So, yeah, that's going to be fun. I'm going to be landing with a slight tailwind. Shouldn't be too bad though, it's more crosswind than tailwind. So we're just flying back. I should just realised I should have been at 225. I, I, for some reason I put it on 215. Bit of a brain fail there. We're trundling along at 226 knots, 5,000 feet, 225 degrees. So I'm going to have a play now and show you navigating by the nav radios. Because if you'll notice, the course knob isn't doing anything. If we change this to localizer or VOR2, suddenly Oh, still not. Uh, can we do it on this one? Yeah. So course two will work now. It's because of this, basically. Because I've tuned an ILS station in, course knob is not going to work again. This seems to be something that's fairly unique to the, the TBM 930, that if you are tuned into an ILS frequency, it knows as much, and it knows what direction the runway is. So it's the opposite way than the way we're facing. So does that make sense? We're going 225 degrees. It knows the runway's 45 degrees. So that green arrow is now pointing the opposite direction. The arrow is showing the exact direction of the runway. 
compared to us. It also, the ILS is already working. It's showing that we're off to one side of it. And relative to where we're flying, the runway is over there. It's just here. Does that make sense? We're here. It's there. We're here. Runway is over there. Obviously, this doesn't show if we're in front of or behind it. Okay. So let's do our next turn, which is going to be to 135 degrees. The only reason I was really looking at the course knob is if you were to go and tune in a different radio beacon somewhere in the landscape nearby, you could then use the course knob to tune in this to find out when needle goes into the middle so you know what bearing the, um, the beacon is from you. So it works like a traditional steam gauge beacon, uh, steam gauge nav radio in that way. But because it's got all these clever systems, once you've got a localizer or you put it in FMS mode, it's not going to behave in the same way. So here we go. I'm going to slow down. Well, not that much. It's got this annoying thing where if you pull the throttles to idle, it starts saying landing gear repeatedly at you. So let's try this out. We'll go vertical speed. We want to go down. Uh, a thousand foot a minute until we get to maybe see I've done it in the wrong order and it didn't like it which is good vertical speed so you choose the height you want to get to you choose the rate to get there so I'm going for two and a half thousand feet I'll just increase that slightly I'm descending at 1500 foot a minute I've overshot this on purpose, really. I'm going to turn back this way. So I want to go 225 degrees again. So I'm going to go 225. And again, you can do an orbit really easily. This is a nice way of doing an orbit if an air traffic controller ever tells you to do it. You just keep advancing the heading knob ahead of the direction you're going. But don't go more than halfway. So we want to end up going back at 315. So there's 315. And you will see that we've done a very nice neat turn. And we'll turn again. We'll keep going round to 45. So move the pip around and we've got the numbers there as well. So we've got 45 here. 45 showing on the pipa. So the plane's going to carry on going all the way around. And then it's going to come in again. So I was just showing you for that for a bit of fun, really, about if you were following air traffic control um, instructions in busy airspace and they asked you to do a, an orbit, then you can very easily go into heading hold mode and just use the dial to keep turning it. And it will do a nice pattern circle for you. So we're coming in now and you can see this is lit up. Let's try it. Let's go for approach mode. Let's see what it does. Now I'm expecting it to just start descending. There's a little green marker here which is our vertical component of the glide slope. So this is the horizontal component, this green line in the middle of the, the circle here. So we're dead on it anyway. This green marker is the vertical component. When it gets to the middle, I'm expecting the plane to start descending. I'm going to start increasing speed. Or increase throttle, I should say, to stop us from slowing down. Let's get the wheels down. So we can look down and we can see we're looking for three green lights.
and there they go. We'll go for flaps one. So again, the airplane is reacting to the flaps to keep us at 2,500. And we're watching this green marker. And when it comes down, the plane should start descending. And it's doing it. It's following the approach path. So if we look out in front of us, There's the runway. You can see a beacon flashing. So all we have to do is keep an eye on our speed. We've got radar altitude showing up here. Our actual, you know, our actual altitude over the floor rather than the barometric altitude. We've got distance. Oh, that's the distance to the um, the next waypoint. Take no notice of that. That's an interesting one, though. Can we use the OBS button to do anything? No, they haven't programmed that properly, by the look of it. Obviously, if you were following a proper flight plan, which I haven't done, then we would be approaching the final waypoint for landing, typically. So we'd have to go and reprogram the route to end at KOTH, and suddenly the distance to KOTH would be correct. So we've got a few minutes before we get there, so let's go and try it. So we're going to go back to the MFD screen, the flight plan. We're going to... Can we delete things while we're in here? Oh, this is actually draggable. That's quite novel. Destination. Select destination airport. K O T H. Enter. And waypoint. Remove waypoint. Home. Yeah, it's still messed up. It still thinks we've got Soski involved. So let's, where are we in terms of the flight plan? There's the runway. Let's go and have a look from outside. So we're coming in. Should we give it some more flaps? The autopilot should take care of it for us. This is cheating, isn't it? We can keep an eye on the speed. We don't want to get into the red zone. The autopilot may well kick out automatically if we get into the red zone. Different aircraft behave in different ways in that situation. Something we didn't do while we were flying around was get rid of the inertia separator. I found out what that is, I went and looked it up. There's um, a filter built into many aircraft that if enabled, it processes air that is coming in through the front of the aircraft, gets filtered before, it, so it can't get into the jet engine, for example, or the prop engine. And you can there's a, a duct there's ducting that you can enable that forces the filters to be used or not. So obviously, once you're at altitude, you don't need it anymore. But while you're on the ground, it stops rubbish from getting into the engine. Now, let's let this go straight into the ground. What's it? Yeah, it's, it's warning us now. Look, it wants it switched on. Well, it's warning us it's on. Because we were at altitude with it switched on. So let's see if this flares. Is it going to do it? We're doing 80 knots. Let's watch it. I was going to say, it's tempting to watch it from outside to see what it does. Is it going to flare? No. It just slammed into the runway. Then it's up to me to slow the plane down now. So we try it. 
So we've just gone for reverse thrust. Whoa, look at that stop. <laughs> okay. And we're going to taxi off the runway and pull the flaps up on our way. So we've kind of learned a lesson there. You can't, it will not flare. So you ought to disable autopilot during approach. You shouldn't have any big surprises from it. Because it's all, the autopilot works by trimming the aircraft. So the moment you turn it off, it's not going to lurch anywhere unless you are holding the stick at a deflection when you do so. Okay, so I think I'll stop the video here. You really don't want to sit and watch me taxiing around the airport, do you? So okay, that was it. A look at the autopilot and a very strange flight path we took. Of flying around using approach mode, looking at uh, the nav modes and the, some of the symbology. Okay, I'll end it there.